Hi, I am Elisa Schulman Janiger. I'm the ACSLA Graywell Census and Behavior Project Director and Coordinator. And we're here at the Point Vicente Interpretive Center where we actually do our Graywell Census. Normally I would be in Dana Point giving a talk on the Graywell Census, but because of COVID restrictions and uh, precautions, we're here at our Graywell Census. And also at our census, we're not operating this season due to COVID precautions. So we just have opportunistic sightings. But this is where we've been doing our census since 1985. So we began watching gray whales from here in the December 1984, early 1985. That's because this particular facility opened in 1984. Our gray whale census project actually began back in 1979, Marine Land of the Pacific, which is half a mile up uh, down the coast from here. We were there from 1984 to 1987. In 1985, we decided to open a concurrent census, so to have one team operating at Marine Land of the Pacific, which is, has a fantastic viewpoint for whales that are headed north. And it's also lower to the sea level. It's about 85 feet above sea level. Where we are now, it's about 138 feet above sea level. So from this position, we have an incredible view of the southbound whales. So what we started to do in our second season, we started, I started, restarted the gray whale census and made it a full season census before it was just a few weeks here and there and wasn't full day. And so we operate basically 12 hours a day, sunrise to sunset, December 1st to May 25th. So we started here on January 1st, 1984. It was the first year of our full season gray whale census. We've been here every year that time uh, doing our census sunrise to sunset and uh, except for this season we ended March 20th last season because of COVID. So this is a fantastic viewpoint for spotting the whales. Marineland closed February 11th of 1987 so we can no longer watch from there. So this became our primary site. So we have fantastic views of gray whales coming across the Santa Monica Bay. We could see them for uh, many miles away and we could watch them for as much as three hours, sometimes five hours or more as they go by. If they're close to shore, we might only watch them for say 10 or 15 minutes as they pass. For northbound whales, it's tougher because we have a Point Vicente Lighthouse here, only half a mile away. We don't spot the gray whales until they come around the corner and very shortly they're right in front of us and then they're going away. So this site had higher uh, southbound counts and our other site had higher northbound counts. But this is a, a fantastic place to spot whales and again we're about 138 feet above sea level and there's a facility inside, this is an interpretive center, open to the public. So you can come in and watch out in the area around us and help spot and track whales and have picnics here and weddings here. And there's also natural history exhibits too. So there's a lot of fantastic information where you can find out more about gray whales and other animals from the peninsula area in Rancho Palos Verdes. So when our gray whale census started, as I had said in, at Marineland in 1979, operated for a few years and then was closed during El Nino 82, 83, and then I started up in 84. We had a fantastic vantage point for the gray whales. We were very close to the shoreline, and we had some amazing experiences there. In fact, in all 37 consecutive years of doing our gray whale census, our highest northbound count was actually in 1984. That was my first year. We only started in January 1st instead of December 1st. So although we had a month less of observations, we had 3,412 northbound gray whales. That time we think the population was probably around 22,000. So that's a huge percentage considering we're only watching during daylight hours and gray whales preferred migratory route off our area is offshore. Their main migration area is behind Catalina Island. Their second preferred migration route is close to shore, hugging the coast within, say, five or six miles. And the third would be mid-channel between here and Catalina. So we had fantastic views of the gray whales, and that particular year was the year gray whales, for whatever reason, came the closest to shore. Almost all of our sightings were within one mile of shore. In fact, sometimes we heard a blow and had to stand up and see the whale. They were so very close. One incredible day I remember, we had calves. That's one of our favorite thing is to count the, the uh, 
southbound calves and the northbound calves. We had as many as um, 106 southbound calves. We had 341 northbound calves in our biggest year. We remember one calf that was coming uh, up the coast with its mom, stopped to play with a sea lion, and the mom had to keep going back and gathering her calf. And then the calf started breaching, jumping up out of the water, and we were counting the breaches. One, two, three, four kept going past us and so me and my colleague Judd uh, Goodspeed, one of our census volunteers, were counting it and taking pictures. 64 breaches until the calf went out of sight. It never stopped breaching. That was amazing. Another amazing day and a rather sad day for us is on uh, February 11th of 1987. I was there. I was anchoring many of the shifts and that's when we were told at noon that Marineland would be closing forever. We did not know that. SeaWorld had uh, Bot Marine Land was planning on moving uh, particularly the killer whales down to SeaWorld. That particular day, we, at that time, we rarely saw dolphin. We didn't see dolphin every day. We saw mostly gray whales. We had pilot whales. We would see dolphins sometimes. Humpback whales were very rarely seen. We didn't see blue whales or fin whales. We had a lot less diversity close to shore. On that day, we had a humpback whale breach seven times. And we call that the goodbye whale. It was very close to shore, and it was, I think, the only humpback whale that we saw that year. So that was a super special uh, um, event that happened, very memorable on a really sad day. Uh, so we can see the same rocks from this side, a rock we've named Whale Rock, because under certain uh, sea conditions, if the surf is high and hits the rock just so, a blow is formed. Looks, it's called a blowhole a blow comes up in the air and looks just like a gray whale blowing. So we could see the other side of whale rock from that side, and we could see that from here. So that's really fun that we're able to see the same uh, landmarks and have be able to compare those counts over all of these years. So what we do is we don't extrapolate the counts, we just use our raw counts. We compare that from year to year and look at the observer effort, how many people are watching. We typically have between three and five or six volunteers at a time, uh, counting the whales, perhaps more during crossover time. And a good community of people, of like-minded people who love nature, citizen scientists, nobody's paid, including myself. So this is a project of the heart. This is something that people have kept going for 37 consecutive seasons. This would have been our 38th, we're looking forward to hopefully opening up on December 1st to restart our census project. So our project is a collaborative project. We are, our project is the longest running shore-based gray whale census. Every year we're out here watching again from sunrise to sunset seven days a week in shifts of usually somewhere between three to six hours per person. Sometimes people just drop in and the public can help a lot by helping us to point out whales. Our gray whale census project is the longest running shore-based project in the world. It's one of the very first massive citizen science projects studying nature along with the Audubon bird count. And we collaborate with other groups, particularly National Marine Fisheries Service, NOAA uh, Services Fisheries. They operate a count that's up at Granite Canyon in the Big Sur area in which gray whales funnel close to shore. They don't have offshore islands there. They do that for the southbound count. And the purpose of that specifically is to gather data to do estimates on how large the population of gray whales is. And now they do that about once every four years. And they did that in 2016 and uh, 2020. In 2016, they came up with just under 27,000 gray whales, which is the highest estimated count in all their decades of counting. In 2020, they came up with about 20,500, which is much lower. And that actually was expected that it would drop down because right now we're in the third year of an unusual mortality event with gray whales, with lots of gray whales stranding and along the coast between Alaska and Mexico, and uh, fewer calves and very skinny whales trying to figure out what's going on with that. But apparently something's going on with their food supply up in Alaska because so many of the gray whales are skinny. For example, in the second week of January this year in Magdalena Bay, which is one of the major breeding lagoons in Mexico for gray whales, of the 81 gray whales that were photographed from the air to do uh, photometrics to see, look at uh, how robust they were versus skinny versus emaciated, there were, um, I believe, 40, 
three, 44 gray whales that were considered out of that bunch, uh, 41 to 44, either skinny or emaciated out of 81. So that's a very high percentage. So this is the third year of what we call an unusual mortality event, which is really important and sad that we can't be running our gray whale census to compare our figures with past years, but that was extended into this year. So that's the 2019 to uh, 2021 unusual gray whale unusual mortality event. So you can Google that and learn a lot more about that. For the northbound migration, NOAA Fisheries runs a different station at Piedras Blancas, which is just above Point Conception. And that specifically is to try to figure out calf recruitment. How many calves survived being born southbound in Baja and heading back up the coast? And to extrapolate about how many babies were born. And that's another great indication of how healthy the population is. So as expected, what you'd see if the gray whales are struggling in their population, that we have fewer calves. And that's what uh, they've been counting. They unfortunately were not able to do their census last year and uh, not this season either. So we're getting opportunistic sightings and also what Mexican researchers are able to do in the lagoons because they can't work with American colleagues who they have to work in a very small uh, group that's being tested for COVID and so on. So uh, we were really hoping the gray whales would look stronger this year in better condition, but that's not what I've heard so far. But we are seeing a lot of healthy looking gray whales too. So it's really important I'm collecting data from all kinds of people along the coast sending me photographs. We've even have some gray whales uh, feeding in some local harbors stopping along the way and, and feeding. And so if you see any whales, just know if you're in a harbor to go really slow because it's possible a gray whale might be opportunistically feeding in there. And be very careful also out on the water. If you see a, a blow, go really slow. We actually brought this from our marine land post. We had this back in 1984. So it's kind of our, our good luck chart here. So if you take a look at this, here's our gray whales. They're born between 12 and 16 foot long, dark in color. We call them pickles because they kind of look like a pickle. They have dimpled head. Each uh, dimple in the head has a single hair. Uh, those six gray whale calves that somebody decided to actually count those hairs there were about 112 to 116 hairs on their head, short hairs about half an inch uh, long. And that's used for sensory. Uh, for example, the calf could go underneath its mom and rub its head, and that probably stimulates her to let down her milk. Gray whale calf could drink as fast as uh, 200 glasses of milk a minute, and it's very rich in butter fat, up to 53% butter fat. Our milk's only about 2%, so they need to get fat because that blubber layer, they're born without blubber, that blubber layer gets to be about six inches thick on a gray whale, and that's their insulation. That streamlines them, that helps keep them uh, warm, but that also gives them a source of energy during the time that they're not feeding. So gray whales make a very long migration. This is the, the mom gray whale will be somewhere between, oh, say 38 and, and 49 feet long or so. So the migration for gray whales, they're spending the summer feeding most of them in the Chukchi uh, and Bering Seas up here in Alaska. And they're there in the summertime months and they feed primarily on benthic amphipods. Those are little shrimps that lay on the surface of the sand or the mud. They build little homes, little tubes, and the gray whales go and bottom feed. They lay on their side, uh, on the bottom, and suck up the food along with clams and crabs and whatever else might be down there. Most gray whales are right-lipped. They lay on their right side, so the right side of the baleen, the filtering apparatus that's in their mouth gets worn down, their flipper, their flukes get worn down more. So when we take photos, IDs for a gray whale, we're photographing the side of the whale and looking for any markings along the side. And they have a series of knuckles on the back, like the knuckles on the back of your hand. So those uh, knuckle pattern will stay the same throughout their life. So they spend the summertime there. And then as the days grow shorter, we believe there's basically the impulse in gray whales as well as many other migrating animals that it's time to move. It's time to, particularly if you're a pregnant female, you don't wanna give birth up in the Bering Sea. They're pregnant for about 12 and a half, 13 and a half months or so. So they go down the coast, past Canada, Washington, Oregon, the majority of them past California <coughs> to head to Mexico. Primarily four major breeding lagoons in Mexico. 
Now in cold water years like this one is, it's a La Nina year in which our water is colder than normal. The, we have many reports of gray wells that are going up into Mexico. They're basically looking for the warmest water possible. And this is where the, the nursery area, where they spend time nursing their calves. The calves get stronger, they learn how to swim. So they spend the winter months down there. Many females will pick a particular lagoon that you tend to see the same female back in there every year. The males tend to lagoon hop, looking for receptive females. Most of the females actually ovulate on their way south, mate on the southbound migration, and that's when they get pregnant. Not in Mexico. So they usually ovulate in November. If they don't get pregnant, they can ovulate about 40 days later, which accounts for some later calves. So probably 85 to 90 percent of gray well calves are born between the last week of December and the first week of February. So they're migrating down the coast here and they're going, say, three to four miles an hour, maybe five miles an hour average or so of close to five miles an hour. And they stop along the way. Sometimes they stop to forage. Gray whales are what's called a plastic feeder. They're generalists. They, they specialize in eating food on the bottom, but they've been documented to eat over 90 types of food including the krill that the blue whales eat. I've seen them lunge feed on krill. They could eat red pelagic crabs. They eat herring eggs stuck on eelgrass off of Vancouver Island. All kinds of things. So that's good because if there is a shortage of food and they could kind of switch, but their preferred food are those little amphipods. And so you might see gray whales stop in the kelp and rest. Their migration is five to 7,000 miles each way. That's a long way to go. That doesn't need the, mean the whale needs rescuing, just let them rest. They may stop to feed. One way of telling if they're feeding is you see a gray whale rolling in the sand or mud and comes up with mud plumes coming out of its mouth or in its fluke print at the surface when the whale comes up, pushes its tail up against the surface and dies down, you might see a bunch of mud. So that doesn't mean that they're struggling. Again, it's probably grabbing some extra food, particularly this last three years where we have gray whales that are, are struggling and, not in, and many of them not in good condition. So they spend the winter time down here and then head back up the coast. There's a small group of about 180 gray whales called the Western gray whale population that's off Russia. And from the over a dozen that were tagged, they, many of the tags kept working and showed that they went across the Pacific, nothing that we predicted, and went down toward Mexico and they actually seem to be genetically separate. They might swim with our gray whales, the Eastern North Pacific gray whales, which now we believe there's about uh, just over 20,000, probably now, because the last measurements were beginning of last year, it's probably under 20,000 at this point, since we still have a gray whale UME. So they'll spend the time there. The calves grow really fast on this uh, rich milk, and then they head up the coast, and we see the southbound migration go by. We start our census December 1st. Generally, we catch the whole migration. During this UME time, the unusual mortality event, the gray whales are migrating later. We're seeing fewer calves. Uh, many of them are skinnier, and some of them tend to head back sooner, we think, to try to get back up to the place where there's the best food. So we see them going south, December, January, and February. Around the middle of February is what we call the turnaround time. We start seeing northbound whales in February. For example, if a whale was going south in December, it might be ready to go north in February. If it's going south in February, maybe it might not go north until May. So we have this crossover migration here as we're much closer to the Baja site than Alaska. We can get them going both directions, for example, today. It's hard to know exactly when the crossover was because our census again isn't going. But it seems from reports is that it seemed to happen probably last week in which people were reporting more northbound and southbound gray whales. So those are the gray whales. The gray whale swims at the surface, blowing usually three to five times. Blow, go down, come up, blow, go down. And the blow is often a heart-shaped blow. Goes up eight to 10 feet in the air. Then they arch the back and sometimes put the flukes up in the air. We call that fluking and stay down usually three to eight minutes, but gray whales have been documented to stay down over 25 minutes, so they could stay down longer if they want to. They do all sorts of different behaviors we might possibly see on migration. Spy hopping, sticking the head out, we actually saw that on our all day uh, trip with Dana Wharf Whale Watch.
long trip out to Catalina Island, we had three gray whales rolling around on the backside of Catalina Island. They were interacting with each other, very likely mating or at least courting. And they were also rhesus dolphin interacting with them, which is quite unusual to see that. They could breach, jump up out of the water, do a back breach, a spinning breach, a belly flop breach. They can rest in the kelp, a behavior called kelping. We've seen nursing here where a calf goes under the mom and then comes up on the other side. Mom's still slowly swimming along. The calf dives under the mom, comes up on the other side and switches sides. And that's nursing behavior. And the calves need to nurse like 12 to 20 times a day. So we can see that. We've even seen moms and calves resting in the, in the cove right down here and see milk in the water. Okay, this is a model of a uh, gray whale. This is our primary object of our affection here for the gray whale census. So we've got long back, big knuckle here. They have a series of knuckles on their back instead of a dorsal fin, the flukes. They've got short yellow baleen that they use to filter. Got a piece of gray whale baleen right here. It's made out of keratin, like your hair and fingernails, and grows just like your hair and fingernails. It's in their mouth like this has bristles on the inside, these separate plates, and looks like a comb on the inside, uh, outside and a brush on the inside. And what a gray whale will do up in Alaska, wherever it's feeding, is we'll dive down and usually lie on its right side. About 90% are right lip, kind of like about 90% of humans are right-handed. And they have between two and five pleats on their throat that expand, so they use a sucking motion. They curl up their tongue like you can curl up your tongue into a taco, which I can't do. 75% of people could do it. Tongue rollers, tongue curlers. They do that, form a suction, and make a pit on the bottom and kind of just plow through. And that actually acts to resuspend the sediments and really makes the area very rich. There used to be gray whales on the east coast. Those are extinct. The only ones we have left are off our coast, which were taken off the endangered species list in 1994 recovered a lot and population again uh, dropped 20 years ago from an unusual mortality event, went down to about 16,000 and went all the way up to 27,000 in uh, 2016 and now dropped back down. We are very confident that once uh, ecosystem, which is uh, warmer than usual up in Alaska, we think is probably impacted how much food is up there, the food will go back up, the gray whales will find more and, and be in better condition. So with our uh, gray whales, we have the baleen. This is a vertebra of a gray whale. This is cervical vertebra in the neck. Uh, they can't really, they have few cervical vertebrae that can't move their neck around like a beluga can. It's got a unfused vertebra. Also, this is a piece of baleen from a blue whale. We see many different types of whales here. We keep track of this. This is an education project as well as research project. And our data can help go toward uh, conservation efforts. Gray whales, we keep track of it on the whiteboard. The last day we were operating was on March 20th. At that point, we had 440 gray whales. We ended about uh, the week of the peak northbound migration, but we had almost all the southbound, and compared to the previous year of 543. We were up to 867 northbound grays. The previous year we had 1612. That's basically because we had to stop way before it ended. Interestingly enough, we had all we uh, had 37 southbound calves. And we already had 13 northbound calves, and that's a very high count. We also see other species. While we're out here, we collect data on other species, not just gray whales, because we can't. And we've had seen 20 different kinds of marine mammals here. So, for example, the ones that we see more often in these years. Fin whale, the last one we'd seen as of March 20th. We saw a fin whale on March 18th. We had a minke whale on March 9th. Humpback whale on March 10th. Common dolphin, March 20th. Day we closed. Pacific white-sided dolphin on the 9th. Bottlenose on the 20th, which we see virtually every day. Rhesus dolphin on February 15th. We also had false killer whales on January 20th, and they were just seen off of San Diego last week. We used to see them much more often, and for decades we didn't see them. Sightings have increased since 2014 when this warm water blob extended up and down our coast. We got more tropical species. We had a sperm whale on February 4th. We saw sperm whales uh, every year for a series of years. The same sperm whales were feeding off our deep water canyon close to shore here. 
So many, many different species. And just to give an idea of um, some of the ones that we see again, what I've seen from here include sperm whale, killer whale, which are actually my favorite. I've seen uh, pilot whale, bottlenose dolphin, doll's porpoise, pygmy white whale I can't because they're in the southern hemisphere, minke whale, which we actually had on our uh, trip out to Catalina a couple days ago, brutus whale, gray whale, humpback whale, say whale once years ago, fin whale, and blue whale. So 20 different species of marine mammals. So it's absolutely amazing the, the variety of species. People can't believe that we have this many. And a lot of it is because we have this near shore canyon that drops off uh, only a half a mile from shore. So our sperm whales would often be about two miles out. So model of a humpback whale, which we've been getting in recent years, feeding right off our coast. In our early decades, we didn't see them. They went right past. Now they seem to be stopping and feeding on both anchovies and krill. Killer whales are predators for both humpbacks and gray whales, as well as being involved in this project as the director coordinator of this project and the principal investigator person who's here a lot. Uh, killer whales are my other passion. My first close to shore killer whales I actually saw off this area was from Marineland on January 29, 1984. That was the first year of our gray whale census. I was sleeping and our top observer Carl Etow called me and woke me up at 6.30 in the morning and said, we have killer whales here. And I said, of course you have killer whales here. You're in marine land. You always have killer whales here. He said, no, they're wild ones. They're right, right in front of us. So got out, got a hold of my friend Bob Talbot. We went out in a boat and we found them. It was the group I named the LA Pod. So I've been studying killer whales actually since 1979 and really interested in who's who, the killer whale world. I'm involved now in a project uh, called the California Killer Whale Project. I've been interested in California killer whales for decades, monitoring how many killer whales we have, what kind of killer whales we have, and who's who, and following the family trees, basically. I've seen hundred, uh, over 100 different killer whales. In one season, I saw, I think, 97 different killer whales. So we have three kinds of killer whales we might see here. One is called the transient type killer whales, big transients, which feed on mammals. Not all of them attack gray whales. When they do, they go after the gray whale calves. In 37 years, we only saw one attack in all those years. And that was May uh, 9th of 2012, right here. It's the only attack we've ever seen, considering there's a lot of killer whales around. We don't see as many here as we do up in Northern California and Central, like in Monterey. They travel in family groups led by the moms. So for example, one of my favorites is CA51 family. There's a mom. She has four living children. One of her kids had passed away. She's got two sons and two daughters, and her daughter has two kids. The oldest one isn't around anymore. They often get together for family reunions. Our uh, CA-51 is Star and uh, Bumper. I named Bumper because that's CA-51C, the third born kid, because he's bumped my boat at least three times. Coming up to the boat, turning on his side, looking at people in the water, even taking his fluke and throwing water at bird watchers off of Northern California. So these guys are amazing. We've also seen um, southern resident killer whales have come down into Monterey. We've seen offshore type killer whales are seen usually offshore, but I've seen them from here. They specialize in sh eating sharks. They've actually, I saw them swimming with sea lions and fin whales. They would never bother them. And we also see some killer whales that have come up from uh, Mexico. I've seen a killer whale out here that has been seen all the way into the Sea of Cortez. And those are what's called Eastern Tropical Pacific killer whales, which means that whole region. So we have such a variety of animals you might see here. This area is open to the public. Anybody can come out here and watch, uh, help us spot them. Again, the census time would be December 1st till May 25th. But the Interpretive Center is open year round. You can come at any time of the day, bring binoculars, family, and uh, just spot and scan whales. You could see all the way up past Malibu, see out toward the Channel Islands, Santa Barbara Island, Catalina Island. Uh, just an amazing, beautiful site. We have the Point Vicente Lighthouse. It's a fantastic place to spend your day. You might see gray whales and all these other different species. Hope to see some of you out here and bring your binoculars and help us uh, count the whales and learn more about them. If you want to learn more about our gray whale census project and gray whales and other whales, 
you can go to our acs-la.org website. Also, the American Cetacean Society Los Angeles chapter. We have a Facebook page, and I post a lot of different whale sightings there. If you want to learn more about our California Killer Whale Project and the killer whale work we're doing and, and recent sightings, go to CaliforniaKillerWhaleProject.org. We have a lot of great information there.